at the fair, they used to have a booth where you put some lotion on your hands and it shows up under UV light after you've washed to determine your training level. See how you're, you're doing with your normal habits. So my wife's a nurse and she's got hand washing levels, you know, of training that are higher than the normal population. And in this pandemic, you know, it's opened up a whole new level of training. You know, this is how you wash your hands. This is the way to wash your hands. And we're all looking to see, did, did this person wash their hands or not? There is a right way and a wrong way to wash your hands. My dad says, you know, that you can tell a blue collar worker from a white collar worker because one of them washes his hands before he goes to the bathroom, right? And let's just assume as I murder the joke that they both wash afterward as well. But I remember, maybe you do too, the little song, you know, this is the way to wash your hands, to wash your hands. You know, this is the way. And I just want to transition that to thinking, is there a right way and a wrong way to follow Jesus? So you say, Aaron, well, what do you mean by follow? Right? He's, he's not here now in, in, in that way. And I think, well, you know, you can you can believe the right and wrong things. You know, there's a right and wrong way there, and, and let's try to keep that right. But in following Jesus, there is a sense of footsteps or, or a pattern, right? Each year as a family, we head up into the snow for a family escape. And sometimes the snow is multiple feet deep. And the tall ones, like myself, um, do our best to establish footprints, if not like a whole path for the other ones to follow in. But again, I ask, do you think there's a right way and a wrong way to follow Jesus? Now, see, the early Christian movement was called the way. We find that in the book of Acts. The way. Jesus himself is the way, the truth, the life. Have you learned his ways? Have you learned Jesus? Okay, so that's kind of a weird question, but if he's the way, we learn him who is the way. But we look at Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. He says, in talking about some of their misbehavior, he says, that's not the way you learned Christ. Interesting way to say that. Assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. You're going to live this way, the new self, created to be like God, right? So Paul is saying this way and not that way. Jesus, assuming you've learned him, pointed us in this way. So some pesky pastor questions for you. Did, did you learn Christ? If so, how? Who, who taught you to follow Jesus? Whose steps are you walking in? Are you in the way? Paul says firmly, I am in the way. And I'm going to read our passage for today. And then let's notice how Paul defends himself against his opponents. They're slandering him. You know, is Paul the seditious agitator that this man Tertullus claims he is? Now let's think about what does he deny and what does he affirm? Paul is going to speak about the way. And so I'll read those accusations again uh, from last week's passage, and then let's hear Paul's response. So going back to Acts 24, verse 1 through 9. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since we enjoy so much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. Right? Bunch of malarkey. But to detain you no further, I beg in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man, Paul, a plague one who stirs up riots among the Jews all throughout the world. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining your, yourself, you'll be able to find out from him everything of which we accuse him. 
And the Jews also joined in on this charge, affirming that all these things were so. And our passage today, and when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You, Felix, can verify that it's not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down in the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept that there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. When I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, and they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation, should they have anything to say against me. Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them. It's with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. Now, I, today I won't focus too much on what Paul denies in the area of wrongdoing. Uh, we, we know he's in the right. He's had a clear conscience about his actions. And instead of attempting chaos, he's, as he's accused, he, he's actually dedicated to unity. We finally get to hear the reason for his visit, which brings sharp clarity to the things he writes about in his letters. He's been raising money to bring to the poor in Jerusalem. So Paul's actually laying low in Jerusalem, just there to bring alms, worship God, uh, care for the impoverished Jewish population. And he's hoping that this gift would bind the churches together in a beautiful way. The, the church in Jerusalem would, would be connected to the church among all the families of the earth, fulfilling the vision of unity from, from Jesus. Just listen to his heart here. It's in Romans 15, 22 through 33. He's written before this time that we're in here in Acts. He says, this is the reason why I've so long been hindered from coming to you, Romans, in Rome. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed to, for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I've completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. So this is the moment we're in. He's delivered, and how did that go, right? But he says, I, I know that when I come to you, I'll come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of his Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now, we have some clues on how this ended up. He did get to Rome as a prisoner, right? But we have Paul's heart for unity, his clear conscience. And, and while we could learn a lot from focusing on that as an example for our lives, absolutely true. With your permission, I just want to zoom in on two parts of Paul's confession. Two parts of that. He says, one, I worship God according to the way, or I'm in the way. And two, that our hope, those in the way, our hope is in the resurrection. So let's just look at those two things. The first one, I am in the way. I worship God according to the way. He believes that the whole Bible, Allah and the prophets, and he worships the God of their fathers according to the way. 
So we would do well to focus on this and actually see if we are in the way. A lot of people that maybe you've talked to, I've talked to, are content with a vague spirituality in which there's generally speaking a divine power somewhere out there, right? They say like, I, well, I believe in God, but I don't want to get too specific. <laughs> Why? Well, specific revelation requires specific accountability. And boy, who wants that, right? Ignorance might be bliss in the moment, but we know that it leads to destruction. We just read about that, the resurrection of the unjust and the just. More, more on that later. But here we see Paul is not falling back on a basic belief, a basic understanding. There is a God and, and maybe that he's good and he, he wants us to be good and hopefully that will work out. No, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except for through Jesus. So have you learned his ways? Have you learned him, Jesus? You'll know the truth that you're in the way if Jesus is your life. Let me say it again. You'll know the truth that you're in the way. Yes, I am. If Jesus is your life. What other assurance would you have? See, the goal of our salvation is intimacy with the Trinity. And that starts now. That is eternal life because Jesus is the life. Now, I'm well aware that most of you don't get paid to pray and study the word and make disciples. But, but that doesn't mean that just because Jesus is, is my life, that he's not your life too. Jesus offers himself as the life that is truly life to you right now. That's the truth, that he can be your life. But the reality is it's difficult to follow Jesus. He goes places we'd rather not go, have you noticed? If it was easy and the road was wide, many people would follow him. But alas, many stay back from the journey. You'll know the truth that you're in the way if Jesus is your life. Narrow is the way and few find it that leads to life, Jesus said. It's narrow, but, but it, it leads to life. Man, I was given the privilege uh, about 12 years back, nay, the terror of leading 25 people through Dead Horse Cave in Trout Lake, Washington, on a spelunking excursion. Now, I've been in this cave before with its low ceilings, 40-foot gravel crawls with only 16-inch clearance. And I'd always come out the way I came in because the exit had this large cavern. I could stand up straight, a, a easy scramble back the way I came in. I always loved that. There was no way I would exit the far end at the rat hole. I've been encouraged by my friends, my so-called friends, that I would most likely fit, you know, through the narrow opening with my arms pinned to the side and my body contorted. Well, he doesn't look a little tall. I'm not sure his legs will fit, but you'll be fine, Aaron. You'll, you'll be fine. Then they'd look at each other and chuckle. I would have to have lost my way, lost track at the group, and be in a panic for their safety, and completely dumbfounded before I would attempt an exit through that personal torture chamber. And the rest of it's a story for another day, but there I was at the rat hole. The rope hanging down, the distinctive ledge I was told that I would see, and this is not where the map said I was. And I knew that smaller people just bent um, their bodies this way and slid themselves up through the gap because the two others in the search party had gone before me and I watched them do that. But my shins would have to break before my body bent that way through the gap. So I had to tell my back it needs to flex backward and jammed myself up into that hole. The dust is coming down on my face and I could see evidence of light in the cavern that was just beyond. 
and I, I've never felt so stuck, so panicked, so helpless and hopeless. All the jokes of my so-called friends, the, the fears, the stories had made this the perfect trap for me. I yelled up into the empty cavern for help, but no one that had gone before me wanted to hang out. So they were out, out into the fresh air, and I, I had met my match. But even though the way out is narrow, it leads to life, right? I got a little help, as I recall, from below to push up on my dangling feet. And eventually, after 72 excruciating years, I, I don't know how long it was, I escaped. The fresh air and sunlight was never more sweet than outside that remaining cavern. Uh, are you trapped? Do you want out of the cave? It's, it's through a narrow passage. Few people will find it. Luke, the, the author of his gospel account, the gospel according to Luke, and the book of Acts, stresses that true faith is characterized by counting the cost. And that's a, a positive and a negative cost of, of what the life of discipleship entails. If you're going to follow Jesus, the narrow path, this is what it looks like. In this passage in, in Luke 14, 25 through 33, the crowds have not yet begun to follow Jesus. And before they make the commitment, Jesus is telling them, you've got to count the cost. So let me read this to you. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Right? Your, your love for Jesus has got to be so overwhelming that the, the, these other things, your own life, the life of your family, it's got to look like hatred. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Bear an execution <laughs> instrument and be done with your life. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to finish, but was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate, whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Well, specific revelation requires specific accountability, and Jesus is tightening that narrow gate. Do you feel the constriction? The rat hole. <laughs> As, as Mike Wilkin puts it, to count the cost negatively means to recognize that one enters into the life of discipleship through detachment from all other allegiances and through giving total allegiance to Jesus as master. That is life that is truly life. Are you tracking with me? It's Jesus and nothing else. And that's allegiance gives Paul his grounding and his confidence when he's on trial. What would that do for you when you go through trials? Paul has counted the cost and is walking the road with Jesus. Mike Wilkins goes on to offer the positive side of counting the cost. He says to count the cost positively means to recognize that love for God, undivided loyalty to him is at the center of faith. Loving God and loving others is what it's all about. Boy, to dwell in the love of God, intimacy with God, well, that's a huge positive cost. I would I accept, right? And as important as counting the cost of discipleship is for entering the narrow way that leads to life, let's consider the cost of non-discipleship that leads to, you guessed it, death. Because only Jesus provides life that is truly life. 
because only Jesus is the life. He is the way. And he's coming back to remake the cosmos. This is the day of the Lord, the end of the world as we know it. And for those in the way, like Paul, it's the place we put our hope. Re re read what Paul says in his trial. This I confess to you, according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Our hope is not in the here and now, but our hope is in the resurrection. This is the second confession. Paul's confession of, I am in the way, worship God according to the way, and that our hope in the way is in the resurrection. And there's always going to be a group of people in this world, usually the ones in power or wealth, who don't want it to change. They like their position on top of the world. They're not looking for revolution or res resurrection. Paul was confronted by a group of these. They were called the Sadducees in Jerusalem. But, but think about this. When you're on the bottom of the pile, when you're oppressed by evil people, and your lot in life is among the marginalized, ignored, or, or worse, the persecuted, you long for the upheaval, the reckoning, the appearance of God in Jesus as your treasure. Israel had this perspective that the day of the Lord was, was going to be the day that Yahweh would put everything right. And in the favor of his people, against the nations, against the peop other peoples and their gods, that God would come, the day of the Lord would finally put them in the right. And the prophets would warn, well, not so fast. You know, the day of the Lord cuts both ways, just and the unjust, along the lines of allegiance or faith in Yahweh. Again, what makes you think you're in the way? Amos 5, 18 through 20. Amos comes seemingly out of nowhere and says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It's darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or he went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light of gloom? with no brightness in it? Can we just be honest here? We like to think that evil is over there, over that line, right? And we are safely distant. If, if, if God wants to destroy evil, he could do that and I'll be fine. But Jesus reminds me often that evil is all through us. The line doesn't run between you and I, between us and them, as... Alexander Solzhenitsyn famously wrote, it runs right down the middle of us, of our souls. So let's examine as we close the cost of non-discipleship. Without a doubt, judgment is coming. The resurrection is judgment day. That hope we have that God will renew everything and make everything right we start to live that way in the present, in anticipation. That's what discipleship is, putting our lives in order in anticipation of this resurrection. We serve and care for people because it's a demonstration of what God will fully and finally do in the great resurrection. That's the hope that moves us forward on the timeline to the person of Jesus who rose from the dead and judged the world. That, that hope, in Jesus says, I'm going to live right now as if judgment is today. Because he is judging the world. He will judge the world. The just and the unjust. Those in the way. And those who got in the way of Jesus' rule and his reign. So do you, do you anticipate his return because you love him? You'll know the truth that you're in the way if Jesus is your life. And I, I want to encourage you. you the, those who will be raised 
to destruction. What a terror. How awful. Let's live our lives in and seeking out the lost and making Jesus our life. How can we do that? How do we walk in the way? How can we live well in his kingdom? This, this is the journey, and it requires training. It's not just about trying. So often we skip steps in our training, and we wonder why we can't finish the task. You know, like running a marathon, the Christian life requires training. You don't just say to somebody, go on out there and run a marathon. Just try it. Just try to run a marathon today. Now, there are training regimens for that, right? But pastors say from the pulpit, on video, on podcast, and I'm guilty of it too. The equivalent of go on out there and try to be a good Christian and high five you on the way out the door. Try it out. Just like try to run a marathon. And you may know as elders, we've decided in our church to, to do better. To, to train better. And I'll be launching another training center for disciple makers in January. If, if your heart is saying, yeah, I just, I need to get in the way of Jesus. I'd like to know more about how to be a disciple, to follow Jesus, and more how to make disciples. Let's say even more than that, to make disciples that know how to make disciples. Yeah. If a marathon requires training, how much more the Christian walk, to walk in the way with Jesus as our prize. For now, I'm just going to encourage you as application, develop any habits that help you keep your eyes on Jesus. He's coming back. And that'll be the day of rejoicing or being caught off guard. Let's be those who keep our eyes on Jesus because he is the light.